It was a brisk and clear, cool morning in the town of Enumclaw. In the distance, the world-renowned Mount Rainier can be seen clearly in the sunlit sky, dominant in the distance. A young man makes his way down Cole Street, Enumclaw's main street, if you will, as the streets are mostly empty this early in the morning. He makes his way to one of the town's main locations, the Salt Shaker Christian Bookstore. After unlocking and entering the bookstore, he flicks on the lights and begins his process of preparing for opening. He places milk in the small fridge in the cafe, gets an episode of Veggie Tales running on the TV in the kids section, turns on a number of lighted displays, activates the background music, and begins preparing the espresso machine for the early morning regulars who are sure to swing by for their orders. Upon another volunteer arriving and everything being properly prepared for the day, the open sign was clicked on and the front door unlocked. Shortly thereafter, regulars came in for their vanilla latte, Americano, and strawberry smoothie. The city attorney, Mike Reynolds, stopped in to chat with the store volunteers along with the store's manager before grabbing his complimentary large drip coffee and heading back to his office. A couple who were visiting Enumclaw on their way to Mount Rainier National Park picked up a few books and snagged a couple of tracts from the free rack. This was a typical weekday morning at the bookstore which had become a regular destination for many members of Enumclaw's community. While the Salt Shaker Christian Bookstore was in fact a non-profit Christian bookstore operated by a church, it had become a popular destination for churchgoers and non-churchgoers alike. The purpose of the bookstore from the church's perspective was simple to share the gospel. The store contained a prominently featured free rack, which contained gospel teaching related resources on a wide variety of topics and secondarily to serve the community. Beyond just the selling of books and operating a cafe, there were many other ways in which the bookstore was active in the community. The store featured a massive Bible collection, which included a number of translations, including those for Catholics and many other denominations. And a volunteer was always ready and waiting to help explain the main differences between each of the different translations. The kids section contained the previously mentioned TV which played a variety of kid-friendly Bible stories along with a Noah's Ark play center. A number of events were held at the bookstore including a free movie night which took place on most Friday nights, musician performances, book signings, and a Little Lamb story time which took place with very young kids and their parents. The Salt Shaker also participated in a street fair the city put on every year during summertime. The bookstore put up a large tent with a number of sale items in addition to a My Bible Dress Up section where kids could dress up as their favorite Bible character and then have their picture taken. Regulars also checked the Salt Shaker's website frequently to find out what movie was playing, events that were happening, and anything else that was taking place at the bookstore. Well, the church that operated the Salt Shaker had specific beliefs, those which were outlined in a tract available on the free rack in addition to their website, items were available for a wide variety of denominations. Catholics, for example, frequented the bookstore for their collection of rosaries and patron saint pendants. When the bookstore was in operation, Amazon was relatively new, if it was around at all, and it obviously wasn't possible to carry every type of book or piece of jewelry that customers wanted. As such, they offered a special order program which allowed customers to order from catalogs and magazines for books or items that they didn't carry. One particular customer by the name of Elizabeth came in every Wednesday afternoon to visit with the volunteers of the bookstore and to place special orders for a wide variety of books. As noted previously, the Salt Shaker was a destination not only for books and Bibles, but for anyone who was looking for a cozy place to sip a coffee and spend the afternoon. A local journalist listed the Salt Shaker as one of the best places for visitors to find free Wi-Fi. And as places like Yelp started to pop up onto the scene, the bookstore had no shortage of positive reviews. In 2008, the local newspaper known as the Courier Herald, commenting on the closing of many stores downtown due to economic downturn, made special mention of the Salt Shaker as they were expanding to an even larger portion of the building they occupied on the main street. Despite the overwhelming positivity exhibited both by the bookstore and those who frequented it, not everyone was a fan. In fact, among other things, these individuals who didn't like this particular church referred to it as a cult.
Now, despite the constant positive involvement in the community, some individuals, largely heading other churches, felt the need to spread rumors about Sound Doctrine Church and the bookstore they operated, the Salt Shaker. From very early on in Sound Doctrine's entrance into Enumclaw, churches became familiar and unhappy about the church's beliefs. Sound Doctrine's pastor, Timothy Williams, insisted on preaching the whole gospel. This included biblical teachings such as the need for Christians to deny themselves, to hate and despise money, to become a servant of all, and to devote everything to Christ in order to become a disciple of Christ. For more specifics on that, however, I recommend checking out the Consider podcast. But for the purposes of our story, suffice it to say, many church leaders were not happy about it. The tact taken, however, by many of these individuals wasn't what you would expect if in fact there were doctrinal problems with Sound Doctrine Church. Instead of confronting specific teachings, these individuals just decided it would be easier easier to invent vague or outright false claims about the church. Some said it was a cult, without the mention of any reason as to why it was a cult. Others said that members were brainwashed, when in fact, one fundamental message Pastor Williams taught members was to learn to reason and to seek God on their own, often encouraging everyone to search the scriptures themselves to see if what he said was true, as found in Acts 17 verse 11. Despite the claims that Sound Doctrine Church was a brainwashing cult, the evidence was quite to the contrary. While the small band of grumbling malcontents spread gossip in secret, members of the church were daily out in the open working, volunteering, and serving in various aspects within the community. Williams often spoke of the biblical fruit which was an outward manifestation of the things the church taught. No good tree can produce bad fruit and no bad tree can produce good fruit, he would say. So as many could attest, especially those who were not regular churchgoers, Sound Doctrine Church's fruit was evident for all to see. And many were happy to interact, whether through the Salt Shaker or the other endeavors the church pursued, of which we'll discuss in a future episode. Because of this, some leaders of other churches were left with few choices. Some preferred to pretend the Salt Shaker Christian bookstore didn't exist, claiming instead that this cult-like church hid in the shadows. Others would acknowledge the church and the bookstore's existence in the community, however would warn their members never to set foot in the bookstore because it was operated, you guessed it, by a cult. Well, unfortunately for one of these particular pastors, curiosity got the better of one of their members who later decided to take their chances with the bookstore. This woman sheepishly entered and could be seen cautiously perusing row after row of books, carefully inspecting the topics. No doubt she expected to see only the titles published by the church's pastor and nothing else, as was yet another claim made about the bookstore. After exploring the whole store, picking up a couple of books and some items from the free rack, she made her way to the register. Oh, you have coffee too, she exclaimed, after which she waited patiently for the barista to make her latte. The barista chit-chatted with her about her plans for the day, and the woman continued to remark how nice the store was. Finally, she sheepishly admitted, you know, my pastor told me never to come in here. What, why not? The barista asked. Well, he said this place is ran by a cult. The barista laughed, asking something to the effect of, do you know how many cults run a public bookstore that will make you a latte? Of course, the woman replied something to the effect of, yeah, you don't seem very cult-like to me, the woman went on to say. From that point forward, this woman who was encouraged by her pastor never to enter the salt shaker became yet another regular who claimed the store's coffee was, as she put it, better and cheaper than Starbucks. Interactions like this, however, were not uncommon and didn't always end as positively. One of the many random fabricated accusations made about the bookstore was that it was simply there so that the church could make money or get rich. Beyond the bookstore being a literal nonprofit, it appeared at a time when even bookstores like Borders, who had significantly more resources, had a difficult time making a profit. Exhibit A would be the fact that they aren't here anymore. Nevertheless, this would lead individuals who had heard these rumors, third and fourth hand, to take them as a cause to harass volunteers volunteers at the bookstore. Hello there. Can I get a check? That's the only job 
you got to do is play with the you and the people coming in and they get business. Do you work with her or do you own this business? Well, you're stealing. If you're not doing something 24 7 while you're working with the people, you're stealing times. I'm an employer. And if there isn't business on this computer, yeah. Yeah. I'd have you out the door. Yeah. No, she is. She's working. I am. <laughs> No plan, no, no turf in the net. What are you working at there? I'm coming up with a gluten-free cafe restaurant list. Gluten-free? Yeah. There's gluten-free? Yeah. I don't know why you guys say I don't shut the door. Really? That's too bad. I think we're, we have a service in the community. You have a service? What service do you have? We have Who's a service. making out on this? You're not servicing you. You're servicing your own pocket. So don't really? say you're oh, doing good for the community here. You're servicing your own pocket and don't bring it down. So don't think you're gonna lie to me. You're looking out for the company. Are you upset? Huh? I know, but you're here saying that they're servicing the community, which is really a lie. Because turn around and, and she's not. She's only servicing herself by making money. She's sitting here playing around on a computer and making her boss don't even know about it. And stuff of that nature. Are you the boss? No, but I know that's And then you're standing behind her doing nothing. You can back in the floor, dust the thing. You're not earning money here while you're here. You want You're not. If you're just standing there holding your hand, you're not earning a penny for this company. Yes, I am. Well, we I don't know. She wants something first and she's got a better mood than I am. Instead of order something, order something that's good for you because she's see, servicing the community. She's going to give you gluten free coffee. I don't want to give coffee. Well, she's going to give it to you anyway. That's what she's inventing. She just told me she's inventing a gluten free coffee. She knows what. I know her order. She's servicing coffee. And she's a community servicer, right? I am. Oh my goodness, you have a free one today? I just can't believe that. Now listen, Mr. Krabby Pants, you have a free one. You know what, if I wasn't a Krabby Pants, I wouldn't get any work out of anybody. No, I don't know. I walk in there and people are staying around, one like this and one sitting over looking at a computer and she just... So after entering the store, harassing volunteers for not working hard enough, and then accusing those at the store of only being interested in money, the man left. Perhaps if Borders had the guy with the cowboy hat there to tell them their employees weren't working hard enough, they would still be here today. While these confrontations did take place on occasion, it was typically at the hand of a person or group of people who had only overheard what latest rumor was being spread about the church. Ironically, those who levied the accusations of the bookstore being a cult did so from comfortable places conveniently hidden in darkness. They were able to either directly or indirectly provide individuals with the ammunition they felt they needed to harass members of Sound Doctrine. But there was little they could do, at least at this point, in the way of shutting them down, which is what they wanted all along. But what if one of these gossip spreading individuals had the power to arrest someone, a police officer perhaps. As it turned out, and this is exactly what would take place. Among those who shared a dislike for the Salt Shaker Christian bookstore and the church that operated it was an Enumclaw police detective by the name of Grant McCall. As it would turn out, Detective McCall's hatred of Sound Doctrine Church went back over a decade. He was well aware of Sound Doctrine's teachings, and needless to say, he did not like them. On one instance, when sending an email to an individual from his police email address, he referred to the church as, quote, evil and twisted. He was asked on the stand in a court case whether this was his opinion, to which he responded, no, this is a fact. This is what we have found from our department's investigation into this group. He despised Sound Doctrine Church so much he would not refer to it as a church. He referred to it only as a group. He never elaborated about what specifically he found to be evil and twisted about the church, other than his claim that the church made no effort to announce themselves when they came into town and never handed out flyers. So as I looked at the historical background of the church, there was a couple things that I realized. When a new church comes into a community, the first thing they do is send out flyers to everybody and say, we're in the church. 
and we'd like people to come. Uh, we have this going on, this going on, this going on, a bunch of things. Their group, at the time they came into Enumclaw, we didn't even know they were there. They just came in. So if they're supposed to reproduce themselves, they haven't done that. So their fruit's not right. Their fruit's wrong, according to the Bible. Not only were many, many flyers readily available within the bookstore's free rack, but some could say that founding a bookstore open to the public could classify as a pretty large announcement about the church existing in the community. Now you might be thinking, hey, maybe McCall has never been downtown in the city in which he polices and therefore had no idea the church and the bookstore were affiliated. Except for in a court case, he testified under oath that he went to the bookstore specifically looking for and expecting to find one of Sound Doctrine's pastors. So he's the person I need to speak to. But uh, when I went down to talk to him, he wasn't at the bookstore. And uh, his attorney called later and said, no. Huh, interesting. So McCall's reason for calling this Enumclaw-based church evil and twisted was because they had no public existence in the community. And yet he knew exactly what church operated public existing bookstore to go into if and when he needed to speak with one of the church's pastors. It's almost as though he's lying, which of course he is. This was one of many lies McCall initiated, lies which King County courts and prosecutors were ready and willing to accept as fact. But as to the courts and the trial, we'll be speaking more about that in the future. However, McCall's animus reached its climax when he discovered an opportunity to damage the church that he hated so much. Without getting into all the details, McCall encouraged a minor to fabricate allegations against an associate pastor of the church. It was on this pretext he was able to make an arrest and perhaps even more importantly to him, begin a new torrent of rumors and gossip about the church and bookstore he hated so much, all sponsored by the Enumclaw Police Department. With the news of the arrest spreading quickly throughout Enumclaw, the pastors and church leaders who had up to this point remained in the shadows saw their opportunity to attack. It's possible this was motivated by vengeance, but it's also possible that some pastors feared an arrest of their own if they didn't comply with Enumclaw Police's strict policy to hand out flyers and make their presence widely known in a manner approved by the local government. In any case, a local pastor sent this letter. It says, may the grace of God touch you deeply. I am sad I feel the necessity of writing in response to your recent call to action with regard to the impending prosecution of your pastor. I don't know your pastor, and I certainly can't presume to comment on his guilt or innocence, but that is not why I'm writing. I'm writing to gently but firmly rebuke you for your conduct with regard to the local body of Christ. While you obviously feel free to appeal to this larger body for support for the case of your pastor, you do not participate with or support the local body as it cooperates throughout intentional fellowship and service. In fact, you contend that our various local bodies are in doctrinal error, which your fellowship claims to correct. I challenge you to change this. Furthermore, I challenge you to issue a public statement of faith, which reveals your doctrinal positions on those essentials of our common Christian unity, which transcend denomination. I exhort you to step out from behind a blank post office box number and reveal your address and the affiliations of the discerning times. The Apostle Paul was careful to insist on transparency in his ministry. I am sad and full of grief to have to challenge you in this way, but cannot escape the conviction that it is necessary. It is my dear hope that you will humble yourself within the larger fellowship of the body of Christ and find unity with us. Thank you for taking the time to hear me. May his blessings be upon you. Now, the Discerning Times is referenced to a free newspaper the church distributed, which addressed the false claims that were being made in addition to clearly making mention of the church's location and the location of the bookstore they operated. Speaking of which, it would appear that operating a bookstore on the main street of Enumclaw did not count to this pastor when it comes to, quote, participating with or supporting the local body as it cooperates through intentional fellowship and service. Furthermore, this individual felt the need to assert that sound doctrine, quote, contends that our various local bodies are in doctrinal error, only later to state a challenge to, quote, 
issue a public statement of faith which reveals your doctrinal positions. It is very curious that someone could feel that the church did not have any doctrinal beliefs publicly available while at the same time saying that they were upset by being challenged by them. In any case, if anyone truly wanted to discover the church's beliefs, they could either A, enter the Christian bookstore located on Enumclaw's Main Street, or B, by Googling the church's name, clicking on the church's website, and then clicking the word beliefs in the navigation menu. Naturally, it's clear that this pastor had no interest in fellowshipping with this church, nor in understanding their doctrinal beliefs, as was made clear by their offense taken by them. It was instead to pour salt in the wound and parrot the same lie which Detective McCall relished, which was that this Enumclaw-based church was hidden in plain sight, doing Friday night movie nights and making espressos for the regulars downtown. If this pastor's intentions were even remotely pure, he had over a decade, which at any point he could have reached out to any member of the church. As a coward, however, he waited for a specific moment when he felt confident enough with the Enumclaw police on his side to throw his rebuke at the church when they were no longer in a position to respond. What made the letter even more repugnant was the fact that the false assertions were couched in wordy, flowery sounding phrases like, may the grace of God touch you deeply, or I am sad and full of grief to have to challenge you in this way, and, and lastly, may his blessings be upon you. As it would turn out, however, this pastor wasn't the only one who saw the opportunity to attack the church freely. And some of those attacks, would turn violent. After the arrest carried out by Detective Grant McCall of the Enumclaw Police Department, the sentiment towards the church and the bookstore quickly darkened. One by one, the steady flow of regulars who frequented the salt shaker began to become fewer and fewer. There were some who were sympathetic and were outraged by what was taking place by the Enumclaw Police Department. However, many did not want any association with what was now being printed on the front page of the city's local newspaper. Sadly, they were outnumbered by those who came in to harass volunteers during a time when the police and newspaper were banking on individuals knowing little more than the accusations made and the headlines that contained them. Beyond the growing amount of harassment taking place among volunteers and Sound Doctrine church members, property damage began entering the equation as well. Feeling free from the restraints of law enforcement preventing crimes against this particular church, individuals took to spray painting the side of one of the church's buildings. The church itself was egged on several occasions. One of the windows was shot at, fortunately not while church was in service and a rock was thrown, completely smashing in a glass door, which was a side entrance to the church. In addition, a trailer was stolen from outside the church. On multiple occasions, physical violence was even threatened. On one of these occasions in particular, a church member was sent a threatening image with the phrase, I hate cults attached to it. After going to the Enumclaw Police Department and producing evidence of the threat and that they felt unsafe, they were told to quote, shut up after being asked to leave without their complaint receiving any further attention. A family member whose adult son attended the church saw him walking with another church member. He rode up on a bicycle and assaulted this church member that his son was walking with. Again, Enumclaw Police took no action. The things I've mentioned here are only a fraction of what took place during that time, and Lord willing, 
we'll cover more in a future episode. However, as time went on and the seriousness of these attacks grew with the inflammatory messages written in the local newspaper and online, it was no longer safe for members to operate the Salt Shaker Christian Bookstore. So after serving the community for over a decade, the bookstore finally closed its doors. As it would turn out, the bookstore was only one piece to a larger puzzle. As if what could very well be described as the hate crime we've covered in this episode wasn't enough, there is so much more that makes the acts of those involved even more devastating. As noted in the pilot episode of this series, part of the reason we're sharing this with you is to serve as a warning for anyone who wants to serve justice and justice alone. Those who do not will always be there to attempt to stop you by any means necessary. For more information, check the links in the description of this video. And also be sure to subscribe and listen to the Consider podcast for the latest news and all things related to serving justice and justice alone. Finally, the question we have to ask once more, was the translation of the name Enumclaw to mean place of evil spirits actually accurate? Until next time, I'll see you in the next episode of Enumclaw.